Hey, beautiful souls and creative minds. Welcome to The Artist Stoop, the podcast where we turn the art world into your personal playground. I'm Jillian Zapata, your host, and I can't wait to dive into the art world with you. Each episode, we'll be kicking it with an incredible artist, unraveling their stories and turning the spotlight on the magic that happens beyond the brush. Get ready to discover new perspectives, forge connections, and immerse yourself one captivating conversation at a time. So grab your favorite beverage, maybe a sketchbook, and let's jump into the kaleidoscope of creativity together. This is The Artist Stoop, where art isn't just a thing you see, it's an experience you feel. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Artist Stoop. Today, I am very excited to have artist Steph Schock as our guest. Steph's art reflects a life life shaped by diverse experiences in cities that she's, she's lived in, like New York, Chicago, Denver, and her current home now in Austin, Texas. Her creative journey transcends boundaries, capturing the essence of places and the emotions that are tied to them. So welcome, Steph, to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. Yes, we're very excited um, to have you on. Um, let's start by how we met. I always think <laughs> yeah. how I, I met all of the artists that um, are on here, and they all have a theme so far. Mm. Uh, I met you at the other art fair. I remember I was did my my laps around, you know, like right after setting up. And I remember walking by your booth and I saw your work and I was totally mesmerized by oh, wow. the one painting that you did where you had the torn fabric with the face and then stitched back together. Like mm -hmm. it literally stopped me in my tracks and you were at your booth. So I took <laughs> it and a couple of the other things and I was like, I got to come back and find her. Okay. And then I kept going. <laughs> and that's when I work my magic the best is when I'm not there. <laughs> because whenever I walked away from my booth, I'm like, oh God, I, do, I you're not, you shouldn't do that. But whenever I come back, there'd be people standing there and be like, hi, can I buy this? And I'm like, oh, this is the best scenario because then I don't have to talk about it. <laughs> they just want it and they don't need to ask me any questions. They're going to take it. It's awesome. <laughs> So, um, your work is very unique and I love that you try different things and I love your color palettes. Um, so let's dive into that. Is there a general theme or subject matter that you typically try and go for in your paintings or is it kind of all over the place? Well, it's a little bit of both. And I think any artist would say it's definitely all over the place. I mean, we always have to rein in all the things that we want to happen. And uh, it's taken talking to other artists like yourself to learn that that's a common thread with all of us. So anytime I want to create something and where I like to go is, okay, if this was part of a larger series, what would be the story? Like, we're not just going to make one piece here. What could this piece be one of many? So there is a, a theme and it's more broken into these series. I almost want the series to stop because <laughs> I have four going in my mind all the time. And I'm like, if I have more than this Gemini quality I have is just going to be more than I can handle. <laughs> I'm not going to get anything done. I totally understand that. That's why it's just like, I always have notes going of like mm -hmm. ideas and concepts and words or songs, and lyrics. I'm like, oh yeah, I'll pull that. Okay. Yeah. That's good. I'll save that for next time. Or I'll save that. And then I have mm -hmm. to like really, tr <laughs> truly like try and focus on, I'm working on this one right now. And then you have right. those collections that you can always add another one to it. Oh, that would work well in this series. Let's add another one. Yeah. <laughs> you were like already done with it. <laughs> yeah. I wish there was unlimited time to do anything that's just comes to mind. But I think the more we work, the more we know that that's just not possible. And you can only store so much art in your house. That's another thing is like, okay, if you, if you could go down this road, where are you going to put it all? What's the plan when it's done? Cause 
I, I love making it, but I, I don't love storing it. <laughs> and I wondered that about other artists, like, what do they do? You know, and they, closet. you what? I have a closet. You have a closet, right? We right now, I'm, I have the luxury, and this only comes with living in Texas, I think, of having a little bit more extra house that we can use a bedroom for as like a storage unit. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> we're in my office, but I have a studio downstairs, which is the dining nook. And then we have a bedroom that we're using as a storage unit. And so there's art in here, there's art in there, and there's art down there. And so <laughs> I'm right now trying to downsize my inventory so, um, so that I can do more work. That's really the plan is like get rid of, move the old work and then make space for the new. Yeah, yeah. I totally hear that. I have stuff on my walls too. I'm like, I can't. Well, like, I love the black and white one behind you, but you know, I'm a black, white, neutral yeah, that, fan. That's actually brand new. It's not done. I just scribbled that on here right before we jumped on. I had a, I had an idea for a part of this new collection I'm working on. And no, I love that. It's, it's, it's going to go somewhere. It's going to come off. The, it needs to go. Come off. I love it. And that needs to go to my living room. <laughs> I don't want to frame that. Thank That's you. That's what I love about works on paper is sometimes the thing that the artist is doodling can end up in buying glass. That's uh, something about art that I've learned. Cause when I started out, I'm like, oh, it's all on canvas or it's all sculpture. But then the more I start following artists, I'm like, oh, this could be on paper and you could just sell the paper or you can mat it and sell it or you could put it in a frame. Like there's this area with like what you have behind you. <clears throat> That's Excuse actually me. where so I just haven't stretched it yet. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Yeah. But yeah, no, totally agree about I like the unfinished okay. edges there. So something to consider. Yeah. yeah. We're going to, it'll, it's the plan for that is to, I'm actually, the piece that stopped me in my tracks is actually the inspiration of where this collection is going of coming off the canvas with the, loose canvas not primed painted and then doing some embroidery because i also come from a background of like so yes. not so i'm gonna sew and stitch and make it get have it get a little sculptural yes i love that i love when i love seeing these artists incorporate beading and textile work i'm scared of uh sewing machines like so I'm terrified. I see a sewing machine and I start, ooh, I get anxious, <clears throat> but I follow artists that use them and I'm like, that is so cool. Yeah. It's really cool. Um, I, I agree. Like, uh, my next guest, um, she's a fabric designer that I used to work for. And so I learned, I learned to sew by working with her. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but this one, it'll, it'll all be hand stitching. I don't think I'll actually whip out my sewing machine. It'll all be... Mm -hmm. Good. I hand some decorative things. Sewing machines are dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> they are. Yeah. And so people went through my friend's thumb. My and he had he he would do he would sew all the time. So I'm like, okay, if that's happening to somebody who sews all the time, then <laughs> that's not gonna go so well for me if I do that. And when I was in theater school, we had to use a sewing machine and I was just terrified. So that's where that comes from. That is hilarious. <laughs> therapy. PTSD. <laughs> so theater you have a di so you have theater in your background but you, before this i know that you also did you were a life coach yes um do you think like you being a life coach you being in theater um and making the switch to artists do you think you have a better understanding of who you are as an artist because of those lines of work I definitely think a history in the arts, no matter what they the art is, whether it's performance or, you know, a sculptor can be a photographer and a painter could become an actor. So I think we're accessing a side of our brain that is activated. So I think theater and the arts open a space for me to do whatever it is I'm doing today. But I don't know how much my history in uh, life coaching plays into it. And that's not, I would love to, t to say, oh yes, it definitely connects, but 
I think my life coaching experience and the training I've done and the work I've done with people, and I did it for about six years before the pandemic and the travel I've done related to it. And that uh, funny really is me accessing my logic side, side of my brain so that I can take people's emotional problems or I don't want to say they have problems, but uh, what their com conflicts are, their things that they're struggling with, obstacles, and help them have a logical understanding of what's happening. Yeah. And that's the life coaching experience. Where I might have a connection is the torn portrait you're referring to. A lot of people s would see it and ask me, what does this mean? And a couple people, I, I would say, I wish I could explain it to you. I did the portrait and just part of me wanted to tear her apart and put her back together. And a lot of people said, well, that's it right there. It's kind of us tearing ourselves apart and putting ourselves back together. So I hate, I wish I could say I was original enough to come up with the idea, but it was the, sometimes maybe it is the person looking at the art can explain it to you. <laughs> And that's where what happened is like, oh, well, that is what life coaching is. When you hire someone to do therapy or life coaching, you're trying to disseminate and dissect what's happening. And that could be the story of the torn portraits is someone tearing themselves apart and then reattaching themselves to look new and look different. Mm -hmm. And so I did like five of them. And I still have like two of them. And I, I love it. I, it's awesome, but I'll be real. The most challenging of any of the others, anything I've ever worked on, the torn portraits is by far the hardest for me to do. I mean, isn't that the best part about being an artist? <laughs> is like pushing yourself to that Can limit. You to me? <laughs> <laughs> Yay, this is the best part. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess the challenge, I, I'll say this if it resonates with people, which that one certainly did. That one sold fast. That one got the most eyes that day, that weekend. And I wanted to keep doing that. But I was like, this is the hardest I've ever done because just doing a portrait can be hard. Now imagine tearing that portrait apart in a way where you can see how it reconstructs. I must have thrown away four portraits before I get one right. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that to me is not fun at all but i think when people purchase it like i some of the best art i've ever seen i'll hear the artist in an interview say that one just kept me up all night that one tormented me that one was one of the hardest and so i kind of like i the cut the person who bought it is in dallas the collector and he hung it and sent a picture of it to me and I was like, oh my God, it looks great in his living room. Um, I almost want him to know that that was, you know, uh, yeah, a, bur a burden to make so that he can be like, this woman did not just throw this together one day. This was like something that was hard work and it took a time, uh, some time to make this happen. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. Oh, I... Um, that's how I feel about my paintings. It's just like, no, no, no. You need to know the story behind it. You need to understand that it, this painting has some complexities and layers to it that mm -hmm. just goes on beyond just throwing paint on a canvas or, you know, whatever. Yeah. yeah. So it's, I, I get that. Um, so this leads me to my next question. When was the last time you experimented with something in your studio? Is what you experimented with sitting in the corner, never to be seen again, or did you share it or build upon it? Yeah, I, I love this question because uh, the first thing that comes to mind is prototyping. Mm -hmm. And that, especially with the torn portraits, I'll do prototypes to see if something works. And then I end up the prototype is the is the art and in fact i wonder if i get more success from the prototype brain of like well i'm just gonna fuck around and find out can i swear on your podcast you sure can <laughs> yeah i'm gonna fuck around and find out and it, um with this mindset of like i'm gonna throw this thing away if it doesn't work 
And then oddly, the prototypes work probably are the most successful of anything I've made. So there must be something going on there where like, I'm treating it like, well, I'm just going to screw around and see what happens versus I'm going to intentionally make this painting exactly the way I see it in my head. And then that's not the outcome that you get. You're allowing the play side of your brain. Yeah. Yeah. That childhood, that inner, I'm just going to color and see. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, it takes the pressure off, but that doesn't mean that I think, okay, well, I'll just approach everything like it's a prototype. I don't think that's possible. No. I think prototype is its own unique thing. Mm -hmm. Um, like I said, whether if I have an example in this room of, um, a Jew back there, and I don't know if you can see it, it's in the gold frame right there that has two pieces of vellum see-through foggy paper mm -hmm. and i'm like well what if i did two paintings and then overlapped them and so that was just going to be a prototype and then it looked great so i framed it so it it there you go but then i'll go and do it again i'm like okay here's let's do a whole series of this and then <laughs> It's it doesn't go as smoothly or as quickly as the first one did. No, yeah, I I get that a hundred percent. It's not a a recipe that can be like rinse and repeat. You know. Yeah, the you piece know? behind you is kind of a prototype, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't like, know how it's going to turn out. What it's gonna yeah, look like I have an idea in my head, but it's gonna. It, it's I'll either love it or hate it and might see the light of day. It might just, you know, get rolled up and thrown in the closet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think that disposable attitude is the, um, the reason why it turns out yeah. working in your favor, you know, always. always now there is a piece. Cause you know, I also do interior design and I had a client who you know, when we were putting stuff together, she was looking for art as well. And she kind of told me she wanted maybe some, you know, black and white or off white and black and stuff. And I was like, oh, I have the perfect thing to show you. Mm -hmm. And I showed her one of your, once again, your ripped canvas. I guess mm -hmm. you call them your ribbons. Yeah. With the frayed edges. And then you put it, you stand it up on the canvas mm -hmm. and then you write on the edges and then you put it in these beautiful acrylic shadow boxes. Right. And my when I showed my client your little one, I don't know how the little one was, probably like 12 by 12, 10 by 10. Yeah. Um, she was like, yes, that's it. And then we had you do a beautiful four by five big one. Big one. And it's like they, the um, stars were aligning because when I finished the small one that you saw, I told my guy, my, my, he's now my husband, I told my my husband, it's so weird, you know, when you convert to husband. Yeah. Um, but I told him, I would love to do this large scale, but like, you know, you have to cut the wood. You have to make a frame, especially, you know, there's so much involved. I'm like, the only way you get to do some pieces in large scale is if you have the client and you contacted me that week. And I really, I'm like, that kind of was a, indicator to me that like if you just put it out to the universe and I'm really I'm not a woo woo person but why is it whenever I have put it out into the universe like I want to do this I, I wonder when I get the opportunity to do something like this and then get it in a matter of days th those moments can be so spooky it's like what are the odds yeah I love manifesting it's it's one of my one of my favorite things Mm -hmm. but yeah no that piece is stunning we haven't hung it yet it's um she just got her couch and when we get the whole room together like oh you know, gosh. i'll make sure to take photos to see the and uh, yeah and i'll and i'll share it with you for sure <laughs> um is there a collection or a particular work that was really really me meaningful for you um and that you just fell in love with the piece or a whole collection mm. um there's one piece in particular from a series I did called Graffiti Season. And it's funny you're asking me about it now because I made it almost, I think it was like six months ago, but now somebody's has put down the deposit for it. Oh. And this is like bittersweet because it's the one out of that series that I'm like, well, if none of them sell, <laughs> I hope this one 
stays with me or if any of them sell, I hope this one stays. And um, out of 12 pieces, I'm down to three and that one is going to get snatched up this week. So that one is get the, uh, the heartbreaker, right? I think all artists, you know, there's something wrong if you're not falling in love with a piece here and there that you're just like, well, if this doesn't sell... And it's framed in everything too. I'm like, I could hang it right now and be happy looking at that. But I have like four pieces in this house as we speak that that are the ones I'm holding on to. So I think at some point it's like, all right, this 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 painting has another home and that home has come to collect it. And just saying that makes me emotional. It's like giving your dog away. <laughs> <laughs> you become attached to them because it's like a little bit of you. So what is it that's making you so emotional about letting it go? Is it the subject matter? Is it where you were mentally when you painted it? Or is it just so strikingly beautiful that you're just like, I love this piece? Um, I, I don't want to sound like an art snob. I rarely look at art and have an emotional reaction to stuff I see. I'm usually like, either criticizing it or trying to understand it, or that's a little too complicated, or that's just decorative and cute. I'm not having like a visceral experience. That one specifically brings me joy. Like it looks kind of like sugar donuts. That's what I see when I look at it. It's called spring graffiti and it's just, no, sorry, summer graffiti. And it, it makes me think of summer and the sun is shining and you're eating a sugar donut. And those feelings come when I look at it. I don't know if I can say that about all my work. I think a lot of my work is just, oh, it looks pretty. And that's what I wanted to make. But this one was a piece where I like, I actually look at it and feel something, mm -hmm. you know, that, that you kind of want to feel all the time. Like, oh, well that, if I was sad, I could look at that and be like, oh yeah, summer. And <laughs> I'm eating a sugar donut. And, uh, now it's now it's going to be somebody else's. And I almost don't want to say that to the new owner. Like, yeah. I would probably see something else. And I don't want to it, yeah. tell them, well, this is what it is. Because I didn't see it until it was done. I'm like, those look like sugar donuts. So I keep that to myself. And that's kind of the beauty about art being a little bit personal. Because yeah. you could look at it and see something else. And I don't want to take that from you. I've described paintings to people where they're like, wow, what does this mean? And I'm like, well, I don't know what it means, but it looks like this. And then they, you can see their head kind of turn. And now that's the moment where I'm like, oh, I, by telling them what I see or what I was creating, I've now shifted their perspective. So I'm noticing with time, I'm getting a little bit more um, withholding what I made. like. I don't want to explain it to you because now I'm robbing you of the opportunity for you to discover it and figure it out for yourself kind of a thing. Yeah, I get that. That makes sense. With mine, I do have, like, I, I totally get that. Um, I once had someone, it was a one of my first series I did that I showed at a fair in San Diego. And it was all, you know, because I always do figurative and it was very figurative. Like it was, a, you could totally see the woman's bodies and everyone had a different fruit bowl. Well, this guy comes up and he's like, it looks like a dinosaur. And I went. Did you see it when you said it? I, I did. I was like, it could just because of the pose that the woman was yeah. in and the colors. And I was like, yeah, it could be a dinosaur. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to rob that from a you. You own that dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. But it was a, it, it is fun to watch people like when you are at a fair or you are there mm -hmm. and you that's the best part I think is standing back out of your booth or away from your paintings and watching people look at your work, you know, and then go, what do you see? Like what, which one are you drawn to? Like, and having those questions before you, you know, dive in or if they start asking questions, but yeah, I think that is one of the most special moments as an artist when someone actually just actually stops and really truly sits and contemplates a piece for in quiet for a minute yeah it's such a um it's so flattering to the artist you know when people give it 
the time to like create their, let, allow their imagination to kick in and start seeing what they see. A lot of literal work is beautiful. Don't get me wrong. My mom has this painting that my aunt Sue sent to her. It's this huge paint, oil painting of this beautiful woman in a garden. And there's no question what you're looking at. It looks like it's a Rembrandt. It, it's that style of like flesh tone and everything. And the first time I saw it, I'm like, this is stunning. And it's been over her nail tool for like 10 years now. But it's one of those things where I've already seen it. Like, I've seen it. It's a girl in a garden. And she's really pretty. And she's just kind of in melancholy. She's like this. She looks like this. It's like, okay, <laughs> there it is. There's the story. She's sitting in a garden. And it, maybe some people are like, well, she's waiting for her boyfriend and he's late and they don't have cell phones back then. So it's like, oh, okay. Was, yeah, you can put a story in there for sure. But I, with my love of her abstract, abstraction is that I can look at it a week later and it's, there is maybe something I didn't see before. There's yeah. a different story in there. There's, is that a cobweb or is that the bottom of a shoe? Mm -hmm. Like, or maybe it's nothing and you just need to let it be this beautiful uh, examination of a shape. Yeah. So that's what I love about abstract art versus literal because you have to put some brain work into what you're looking at. Yeah. No, I totally, I totally get that. And I love that. That's why I paint abstract, even though it's taken me a long time to get to that point where I can paint abstract. Like mm -hmm. people need to understand that painting abstract isn't just you walking up to a canvas and throwing paint on it and walking away and going, it's done. Like there is thought, there mm -hmm. is planning. I have an idea for a show and I'm not afraid it's going to get stolen. You're, you, you, you're a writer. So maybe we need to do this. Oh my goodness. I have an idea. Okay. <laughs> but we're, I mean, we're about to give it away if I say it, but what if there was a show on like HGTV where you get people who say stuff like I could, my eight year old could do that, or I could do that. And then we purchase the canvas. that's exactly the same size and all the same paint colors that were used. And then all the tools. So now it's all in front of that person and say, go. <laughs> and then we watch. And then you watch. <laughs> and then that person, bless their heart, because I I would do it too. I'd be like, well, where did they start? Like, well, yeah. okay, well, there's a blue background. So maybe start there. And then like, try to figure out how the artist did it. And then when it's done, that person who said I could do that would look at it and say, yeah, I can't do that. I can't do it. And yes, he can't do it because that thing that looks so easy to do, it, the the shocker is that it actually was really hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's like even that painting that's behind you on the wall. Like, I don't. Uh, that guy? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, someone could walk up and be like, oh, she just. I could do that. Hey. I could do that. Just give me a Sharpie. I can, I can do that. You change some lines, color yeah. here. Do you How hard can this be? It's hard. Well, it's interesting you say that because like, ooh, that's, this is interesting because like we see pictures on TV or on a computer screen of a painting in the background. It's like, I could do that. But if you were here and you got close, you see that that's all clasper. So somebody would say, I can do that. And in our show, if we had it, there'd be a bucket of plaster and they'd be like, well, what's the bu bucket of plaster for? And it's like, well, you can do it. So uh, we, we need to, we, we get, need to get to plastering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I think we, I think we're hitting, hitting it on the head here. Like we need to do this show. <laughs> <laughs> we got to do this show, Jillian. You and me. <laughs> I can see the commercial already. It's like Steve in Ohio said he can do it. So we went to <laughs> we went to Michael's and got all the paint and all the canvases and we're gonna watch his eight year old do it because he said my eight year old could do that. Let's watch you do it, Steve. Oh yeah, I'm so condescending. <laughs> oh, I love it though. It'd be a really good show. 
Um, so <laughs> now that we're on the DIY network, <laughs> that's where it needs to go. <laughs> exactly. Sorry, I'm interrupting you. <laughs> no, no, you're totally fine. This kind of segues, segues into my next question. Is there any funny stories behind any of the pieces that you have? Or is just like any, like when you were painting it, like. Yeah. How can it be funny when it is so tragic? <laughs> <laughs> um, no. I, I think, um, no, I don't know much humor in, in the work. I don't know much humor. No. I've never, I don't think I've ever done a piece where I was like, ha, 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 this is fun, and then looked at it and like, is that what you mean? No, like, like is there a fun story behind any of them? Not funny in itself, like, oh. ha, ha, sorry if I said that wrong. No, it's all good. Um, you know what, like, graffiti season was like, every painting is a different month or a different season. That's why I did 12 months. And I did four seasons. Yeah. And then the torn pieces. And that's just torn fabric, whether it's a painting of a person or the stand-up ribbon series, which I love the most. I'm having so much fun with it. The stories with that is like a lot of the travel I've done. So one kind of inspired by Bali or Morocco. The colors and the tones I would see while traveling can now be in a series. Um, but right now I'm leaning into a series to do, um, regarding, I want to call it adolescent and it's going to be every year of my teens. So yeah. Um, have you done any yet? I have this in paper form. I did this for a show and it's kind of big, but this to me, I, when I finished it, I got Preteen is what I titled it, and that kind of started a whole idea for it. And then I'm going to grab this really quick because I just finished it. And everyone listening, I know this is a podcast, but um, this will also be up on the YouTube channel, so you can also visually see, and all those things will also be in the show notes, um, so you can see the paintings that we're talking about. I know I didn't even think about showing stuff, but I'm in a room full of finished pieces oh no you're fine room. oh good this i put in plastic because i'm always afraid that something will spill on them so i'd rather put them in plastic immediately but this one is 17 and i'm like what was going on when i was 17 it was just like a time that was super angst for me so you go from this preteen. this is me 10 11 and 12 it's right like Pink innocence salmony color with yeah white. maybe it was that green in the middle there with some white over the top yeah very soft like very like what you would actually see in like a little girl's room like right and then all of a sudden i turn into this person that <laughs> like so what happened between a lot of black years and this and nirvana nirvana is what happened yeah like the grunge era and uh anarchy you know, I hung out with the art nerds and I was, you were asking about how much the past influences or helps what I do now. And for eight years, I did pottery. So I hung out with and sculpt like a uh, bust sculpting, which frankly, fun. I think I should get back into at some point because I, I did really well with that in high school, but it was clay and I hung out with all the art nerds and we were all freaks and geeks and we spray painted the side of the school and we smoked cigarettes and so that's kind of where I want to go so when I think when you said fun I'm like this is something that could be so much fun that like this once they finished it on paper like what if I did this is like actually a larger scale painting kind of like turned it into a prototype once it was done yeah so that's kind of fun for me to think about like, oh my gosh, I got to go back in time and investigate what was going on when I was 14. So there's a challenge there, but it's like a fun challenge where it's not going to be too tormenting. Um, I love I that. I actually watched you. You just recently posted the painting of that one you just showed on your Instagram. Great, yeah. And I was like, why is she adding tallies on it? So thank you for explaining it to me. 
Yeah. Thank you in the years, right? I needed that and explanation. Then, yeah. Yeah. And um, I wouldn't do that with all of them. Like for the age of 10, I was big into hopscotch. So I want to just do a simple line drawing of a hopscotch because that's that was my jam when I was a kid. That was kind of my way of like getting a, a group of kids together and we can go do this and be our own little group for this lunch break during school. And so that to me, it's like, well, if you're going to investigate your, that adolescence and being in your teen years, what were you doing during those times? Like you just have to paint what you saw and what you were doing. So yeah. this is going to be the work of trying to remember that time. Cause I'm 48. Takes a lot of journaling and going back through old photos Ooh. to, to spark the interest, like go back and look through family photos of you at those ages. And like, if there's an outfit that you're wearing, it's, it's amazing to me how, uh, um, an outfit or a photo or just like a little snippet can can put at least me personally back into that exact scene and I have almost like I remember a lot of stuff like yeah. almost like conversations and whatnot so it's like take take the time to journal look at photos and mm. put yourself back there mentally that way and see how the series will grow because this sounds really cool I'm I'm it's not even painted and I'm already digging it <laughs> yeah yeah I'm excited about it but um also get nervous about it like does that ever happen to you like you get the ideas flowing but then there's this little bit of fear of like what if this doesn't work I mean as a former life coach I know better than that like the first step is acknowledging that the voice is said that to you and saying okay thank you I hear, I heard you. I'm mm -hmm. going to do it anyway. Right. Y yeah. How often does that happen to you while you're working? Uh, right now, this new series that I'm going to work on because, you know, it's, a, it's a sensitive subject. It's about, you know, my former relationship in an abusive relationship, you know, physically, yeah. emotionally, verbally abused and gaslit and all that. And so it's just like, it's, something that I've been thinking about for, you know, however long I've been out of that relationship, six years, five years, five and a half, six years. Um, and I'm now at this point saying it's time for me to do it. I need to let it go. I need, it's been stewing for that long. So yeah, there's a huge fear and like how it'll be accepted in me painting it and doing it because, and it also brings up a lot of uh, memories. And emotions. It's, it's so like, I love talking to artists about stuff like this because just you sharing that now, even though I, I love the painting, but I, so, you know, when you look at a piece of art and you're like, but why, what is it mm -hmm. that's happening there? So that when you open up to that, the first thing that comes to mind is, so we've all had some level of interaction with someone that was really unpleasant. And so you're making something relatable, but it's so hard to articulate why it is. Like, why do I feel relatable with that piece? And by you saying that, I'm like, okay, so where did I see that thing that you just said? Did I? Yeah. And if I did see it, where have I experienced it? Mm -hmm. Like, maybe that happened with an ex-boyfriend. Maybe I also had something similar. Yeah. Like, this brings, creates a connection between me and the artist and the artist and their, their people who are looking at it. Yep. That's, that's the whole point is to connect those stories and those emotions. And, you know, I know this episode's about you, but just a quick about my art. That's, that is my whole thing for every single collection that I do. It's because I am a writer. You know, I went to film school and I took creative writing classes forever. So we connect through stories. So with everything that we do, whether it's music, uh, books or movies, it's a, it's a story. And my goal is to translate those experiences onto canvas. So it's just like, I had my conversations collection where each painting was based on a conversation at various ages, stages of my life. Then I had my 
chemical rapture where each painting was based off of a different song that talks about you know sex and its lyrics so just like in your face you know mm -hmm. whether it's a harry styles song or a john legend song or a you know a dave matthews band song um and having those different perspectives and then me translating that experience those lyrics and that experience onto canvas it's just like we've all had if you listen to the lyrics we've all had one of those experiences at some point and that's why we relate to that music so much so yeah. being able yeah. to pull it in on canvas it's just like i now having been so far out of my relationship is i discovered that there are so many women so many women who have been in some form of an abusive relationship so yeah. at this point and men and men and yeah men. mostly i've talked to women but yes yes yeah yeah men. yeah um so it's not it's not just a me thing but so it's just like i'm not painting it for myself i'm painting it for everyone who has had an experience, had had experience, experience. yeah so it's not just my story it's their story too yeah Yes, it is. So that's where it's just like trying to have that emotional, you know, story connection. It's just like how many other people like with this adolescent series that you're going to do because it's going to be amazing and you're going to do it. It's like how many other people will be able to see that hopscotch painting and look at it and go, oh, my gosh, I totally remember. Yeah, I remember. I, remember I used to do that and we used to have instead of we had a rock or we used to use bean bags to t do, throw the hopscotch or oh, I totally remember being high school and angsty and wearing, you know, those really baggy baggy pants and like being yeah. my parents all the time and wearing way too much black eyeliner <laughs> <laughs> that is so, you know what i mean but i don't get an idea one of them should maybe be done in black eyeliner <laughs> but it's just like that's the stories that we're telling we're when we when we go back and touch on our past experiences and we translate onto canvas so many other people will be like oh my gosh i've had that moment I remember that too. And that, yeah. especially when it's abstract, it's just like, that's where the people go. Oh my gosh, I bought it because of this. I, I was, I was drawn to that painting because of this moment and this. Yeah. Memory. And it, it reminds, it kind of makes me think about times where I'd see a painting and like, think, why does this feel familiar to me? So that's kind of what can come of it. Like with your piece back there. If it feels familiar to someone, it could be because like almost like a deja vu effect of like, yeah. oh, I felt this before. Mm -hmm. And so to accomplish that is just, you know, that is just something else. Like if somebody saw some something that I made and can connect it with something personal that happened to be familiar to something that happened to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That would be true. And maybe that's happening all the time, but we don't always know it. We don't always hear it. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's why I connected to your ripped portrait. Like when I first saw it. Yeah. yeah. You know, the like that. Towards, yeah. Yeah. There was this, this feeling that I was just like, I need to know everything about this painting. Yeah. Something was going on there for people. I don't, I, to this day, I don't know if I've made a piece that had that much of a reaction. I've done, I did a, I hung into our portrait recently at a show and it did get a lot of like, well, I, I gotta have this. I gotta have this, but like nobody, nobody purchased it. And she's, she's beautiful. Um, but it's one of those things where like, I don't want to take it to a lot of shows and hear the same thing. The plan is, you know, to, for her to find her home. So I think if I did the other art fair, I probably wouldn't bring her cause I already did it. So I did too, and I saw you at both. Oh, you saw her. She was the one in the center of the last show, and and just she just didn't find a home. And then I took her to another show, and she didn't find a home. So that's another talk because, like, what do we do with the art that people seem to love, but it's just not finding a home? Do you that's, just keep showing it? Yeah, you do. And that's also why we're doing this podcast is co to connect collectors with artists. There, yeah. So that has happened to me as well. I have this one piece. It's called What's the Skinny? It's from my conversations collection. And it's a piece that I 
let's how do I word this? Um, it's totally different for me, like the color palette, everything. But every time I show it, and I've shown it, you know, in a virtual online gallery, I've shown it in New York. Um, it's I've shown it at the other art fair, mm. and people have asked me about it online or in DMs. Hey, is that painting available? No one buys it. It's the most bizarre thing. I was like, people, buy buy the painting, buy it, just buy it. <laughs> it's I've had people say, I love it. I'm like, you know, you can buy it, right? <laughs> it's not good news. This could be in your living room. It's available. It is available. It doesn't have a red dot yet. <laughs> it's a good one. You could be the version you person. You could be the red, red dot. dot. Yeah, <laughs> you could be that person. So I totally, yeah, and sadly and it's one of my favorite paintings because it has personal meaning for me it's you know it was about my best friend and the conversations that her and I have they're just like endless and it's mm -hmm. just and it, you look at it and it brings you joy and happiness like I've had people buy prints of it but no one has purchased the actual the piece the piece and I was like people I actually just had How someone DM me about it Oh, really? Yeah. What size is it? It's uh, 16 by 24. So it's on the smaller size. Yeah, that's not like too crazy. And it's like perfect for like a hallway or like a skinny little wall or mm -hmm. like, a, you know, and work great in a little kid, like a little girl's room or. Right. It has versatility. It has go anywhere. And it has a sister painting. So it's just like, they're not identical, but they, I painted them at the same time. So they have mm -hmm. the same energy to them but yeah so the paintings that we love and people go i love them i love them it's like it's like they're maybe potentially meant for our own homes possibly yeah i have that do you, do you see the one it, it's the my crown series or it's the little plastic people inside the yes shadow box that one got so much attention and people are like, whoa, can you explain this to me? Or like, what's going on in there? What are the people doing? Are they uh, with each other or against each other? And nobody was buying it. And it's right now hanging at Vaughn Gallery here in Austin. And I have a feeling it's not going to sell. It's like the show's over this coming weekend. And I kind of want to just keep it. Like that one to me, it's like, I'd be fine if it didn't sell. That one... Mm -hmm is the OG. It's the first one I made, the prototype, if you will. And it looks beautiful when it's hanging in our house. So I chalk it up to, because it's in a shadow box and it has these plastic people in it, I think people find it really unique and crazy, but they don't really see it for their house. Yeah, it's, like, it's going to take a unique person to go... I need that. I feel that energy. Yeah. It's mine, you know, yeah. and it, and because of the fact, because I know which piece you're talking about and it does, mm -hmm. those shadow boxes are three inches deep. deep. So it's, you know, it, it's a sculpture. Yeah. It, it's more of kind of a sculpture piece to it. And mm -hmm. if you were to hang it on a wall, you'd make sure you have to make sure that no one's going to run into it or like yeah. if you did it in a gallery wall, which I think it'd be really pretty in an assortment of other paintings on a gallery wall you just have to make sure that whoever's walking by isn't gonna doesn't yeah it's not a heavy traffic area and or like make sure there's a table underneath that mm -hmm. just so that people are running into it i mean i'll i'll go right now the interior designer and me i'll go find six other artworks and that piece and put a you know throw it in like a little render mm -hmm. and be like Boom. People buy every one of these paintings together. It's stick together. it on your wall. Wait, what is that? I like that. Sell everything in a set. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, you could do that. Mm -hmm. You definitely could, you know, get some funky different frames of a few. Yeah. Because like, you do have such eclectic pieces that uh, that's also one of the things I love about your work is they all don't look like. You know what I mean? Yeah, because it's like an asset, that. but it's also like, I wonder if it's a setback. No, it's not. <sighs> well, you and I know that. I think, though, like, people want to see, when you get a following, is it for that body of work? Like, I did, okay, here's a good example. Now that we're talking about crowds, I did her, that one. Then I did a bunch of smaller versions, and I got a ton of followers. And then I did a painting on Instagram. 
And a ton for me is like, <laughs> I got 20 people. No. That's but I did lot. randomly get a lot of people clicking it, liking it, asking about it, like following me. And then, and then I did something so not like that, like a something mm -hmm. like that. And it was the first time I saw a big drop in followers. I was like, this to me, and these things could be unrelated. We can't, I don't think we should ever quantify what's happening in our business based on followers. But no, I thought that that was really interesting that everybody was seemed to be buzzing on my profile about this one crazy crowns piece mm -hmm. and then posting something that was so unlike it. And it's like anybody who's new to my work, where if they are following me on Instagram and give a damn, would probably say, oh, well, I don't like this, so I'm not going to follow her. But if you've been with me for a while, you'd be like, no, she's done stuff like this all this time. Yeah. So I, I do think it's important to constantly throw curveballs if Absolutely. you're not going to be consistent. Yeah. Like, all not consistent. Is, yeah, this is really un random stuff. It's not all the same, like you said. So if that's the case, then do a floral painting one day and then do something really abstract the next because... If you're telling people, look, I'm never going to be the same, mm -hmm. then they won't be turned off when you do you hear, see this documentary about the art industry and it involves Poons. I know is his last name. I have a terrible memory for names, but he made a piece in the late 50s, early 60s that was blue and then had these red dots, which can be very disorienting to the eye, these two colors together. Yeah. And people went ballistic over it and it was during this time where abstract work was like really hot yeah you know and he's in new york with warhol basquiat and everybody loved it and so he did kind of a series of that and then he did something completely unlike it and boom he was done hmm. i think the art world like, is changing so much now that i don't think it it matters and i honestly personally think like, think of it this way i once told my friend um to think of her art and um her designs as this i said think every musician ha gets to with each album gets to recreate themselves the beatles when they started out they started out as a kind of a pop rocky cover band Right. It, and it, and every original boy band. Yeah. Yeah. And as they continued to grow, then, you know, their music changed and they experimented and tried new things. And if you had come on board, like if you had just discovered the Beatles when they introduced their White Album, like, and then you saw like what they were first doing when they did with the Beatles, you'd be like, is this even the same band? Yeah. But so as artists, we're allowed to evolve. We're allowed to try new things. We're allowed to experiment. And I think that's one of the beautiful, because otherwise life would be just too damn boring. Like It really would. If I was doing torn portraits all the time, like constantly tearing it. You'd get fabric, so bored. Yeah. I'd be like, time to make the donuts. I mean, that is, <laughs> is the same thing every day. Yeah. So, Which is why I I really think, I thought about this in the last couple of days, like when things are not going according to, like, when is my art career going to get going? Like, I want to have orders all day, every day. I have to remind myself that this was always a long game. And when I do that, oh my God, it's so relaxing to me. It's like getting in a hot tub. I'm like, oh my God, there is no rush. There is no rush. Where are you trying to get to? Like, don't focus on like, why isn't everything selling now? It's like, I haven't done a show in a while. And actually, yep. in the last month, unloading my inventory is code word for putting it out there more and letting people know it's for sale and maybe we're doing a little bit of a price reduction on some stuff I went across it with. You know, like making it and then boom, sales, sell, 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 sell. And it's, I think, energetically when I put it out into the universe, I want to sell these items. I'm ready for yeah. the new thing. Yeah. Then then they started moving. So yeah, the universe is listening and it's still offering based on your mindset. And the long game is 
a reminder that this is, if you thought this was all going to happen overnight, then you clearly don't know the, the industry that you're in. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I a hundred percent agree with that. I've been painting, uh, like recommitted myself to being a painter for the last nine years. And even then, like, I haven't sold a lot of work, but I've really now finally in the last two years, finally gotten into the groove of who I am as an artist, mm -hmm. like, and like been like, this is me as an artist. This is what I'm making. I mm -hmm. finally am now able to say, here's my artist statement. Here's what I stand for. Here are the stories I'm telling. Cause before I was like, I don't know, I'm just painting, you know? Yeah. And fussing around, finding out. Yeah. And so it's definitely a, a long game, but yes, recommitting and like going through and just being present and actually people need to understand like co future collectors, like as an artist, being an artist is a business and in order for our work to be seen, yes, we have social media, but in order for our work to be in galleries, we have to sit down, we have to sit our butt in our chairs on our computers and do a crap ton of research to find a gallery to submit our work to. And even then we have to wait to see if our work will get submitted. And then sometimes, sometimes is that a show that's only going to be for a week? Is it a month long show? Um, is it a gallery that we have to pay to be part of or are they just going to accept our work to be there um is it a, is the gallery even a good fit for us or are, are they going to do enough marketing do they have the collector list that they say they do that's going to show my work you know it's it's hard it is hard i just got and exhausted talking about it <laughs> i learned so I'm big, I was a life coach, as you know, and I would tell people, if you want to learn how to do something or anything, you should hire a teacher to, a consultant or a coach to kind of get you in the direction you're trying to, you know, fast track is a good way to put it. And so I did tie Nathan Clark's coaching groups. And when I applied, I said in the application, um, I want to know why you would let me in your group. <laughs> it's like using the work. So when he let me in, he's like, you're in. I'm like, yes, I want to know why you let me in. And he's like, oh, well, based on the work, I just thought you were at that place in your career where you needed some direction. And, and I'm so happy I did it. Mm -hmm. And I had the intention to get a little bit more education about the art world. And he would... When you're talking to somebody who has the experience, it is insane how much it alleviated so many questions that I had. And, you know, I want to treat this as a business. I like, I love the art. Clearly, I, w I could do anything else and make more money. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a business and long game business at that. And having said that, talking to somebody who has been there in the trenches and is like, I'm, you're going to pay me to tell you everything, all the secrets, all the things that I've learned. Yeah. That I wish I had known earlier and it paid off. And I mean, just like, wow, I came up with two series while coaching in that group, while getting coached in that group that I'm like, would I have come up with that if I hadn't done this group? Like that to me is a cool question to ask is like, would I have even made these, the crown series and the torn ribbons, mm -hmm. the ribbon experience? Would I have even come up with that if I hadn't done the work that was inside that group? Yeah. Makes you think. It does. Which is my advice to anybody listening is no matter what you're doing, whether it's art or something else, life coaches, you know, I rarely hear them being made fun of, but... I'm always like, you have no clue how valuable they are. Cause like anybody who has, is going to invest in themselves enough to take that step and to, to hire a coach. That's already the hard part's done. Just writing the check. It's yeah. like you saying I'm worth investing in this aspect of my life. I think it's really, it's, it's, you know, the equivalent of also like going 
to therapy or just like any form of self care, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. And this has been a very insightful conversation. And I'm glad, you know, the few times that I have been around you, like I've really enjoyed talking with you, but now it's just like, I knew I liked her. I knew I liked her. <laughs> now we're having a real conversation. Well, it was real when we met, but we only had like 15 minutes. But like, my grandfather was there too, you know. <laughs> I adored him. <laughs> I apologize. And he's so cute. She's just like, he's adorable. He is very handsome. You should have seen him like when he was younger, like in his 50s. Oh, God. Yeah. Well, he was probably people, a heartbreaker. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, people about often ask me, is he related to Clint Eastwood? And I'm like, <laughs> no, he does not. look like him it feels like we are not saying this about my dad my dad's awesome and he d he does what your dad did like walks up and asks questions and if they're confused they'll let you know they'll be like i just i don't really fully know what's happening <laughs> like it's okay and if not they'll <laughs> tell you their life story and just you just have to sit there and listen <laughs> Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on and bringing all the laughs today. I I needed that, that was today. Fun. It was fun, more fun than I thought it would be. But like, oh my gosh, I don't know how to talk about art. You it do. You've been on here for like almost an hour. <laughs> I know. We could keep going. But we really could. Let's but... spare your audience that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <sighs> Catch my breath. But next time uh, I come to Dallas, though, if you don't have lunch or dinner with me, I will be insulted. Oh, well, I I plan on coming to Austin and just staying for the weekend. So you know, there's that. you will visit me. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you will come and visit. Yes, my I have an open door for you anytime. You and your man can come and have dinner. Our, yes. Those are guys do carpentry, so they all they'll have a lot to talk about. You can talk about screwdrivers. It'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> Not the drink. The tool. <laughs> or both. <laughs> yes. So, audience listening, uh, I will make sure to include all of Steph's Instagram, her website, where she's showing her beautiful artwork. And in the show notes, I'll also include um, photos of all the wonderful pieces that we were referring to. Or you can watch us on the YouTube channel and, you know, fully grasp everything that went on here today right. so thank you steph for coming on and this thank is you. another episode of the artist stoop and that my friends wraps up another colorful episode of the artist stoop a huge thank you to our incredible guests for sharing their art and stories if you enjoyed the conversation as much as i did make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss out on the next stoop chat and don't forget to spread the love. Share your favorite episodes with fellow art enthusiasts and let's build this community together. Connect with us on social media at Jay Guse Studio and Jillian Zapata Art for behind the scene peeks, artist spotlights, and a sneak peek at my own art. Until next time, stay inspired, stay curious, and keep that creative fire burning. This is Jillian Zapata signing off from the artist stoop. And remember, the world is your canvas, so paint it vividly. Mm -hmm.